So I'm going to begin with a word, elder. And I want you to conjure it in your mind. What comes to your mind when I say that word? Because it's going to come up a bunch today. This past Friday, the 12th of August, was International Youth Day. The theme this year is intergenerational solidarity, creating a world for all ages and leveraging the full potential of people of all generations. In March, 2021, the United Nations released a global report on ageism, which emphasized the extensive information deficits concerning ageism against children. And despite the absence of research, young people say they encounter barriers in employment, politics, health, and justice as a result of their age. So I was speaking with a friend and educator, Jen Buchanan, from Future of Schools, and she was sharing it's crucial to leverage the full potential of all generations to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Across generations, solidarity is critical for sustainable development. And we, when we look for opportunities to empower others, especially across generations, we create a ripple effect of change far greater than anything we could achieve on our own. And we are able to move closer to ensuring that nobody's left behind. And one of my wishes in this work is to ensure people focused on education innovation have the opportunity to be mentored by emotionally connected elders. I believe the intergenerational transfer is imperative. And I've been having many discussions with you and others in education around the concept of intergenerational learning. I don't pretend to be an expert, but I'm putting my ear and heart to this topic. And these following questions have arisen. I'll share them and I'd like you to swish them around in your own mind and we can get to discussion after our special guest. So can I just get your attention? Can I ask everybody that they just listen into these questions and ask yourself as you're working in education. We can often dismiss the wisdom and the value of our elders. How can we shift this? We forget we're cyclical and lean into the myth of only linear progress. What can we learn from our past and previous models? We see the next generations coming up behind as threats to our being instead of part of the natural cycle of the world. Instead of nurturing and supporting them as they grow beyond where we could have reached or dreamed, we resent them or sometimes even squash them. How can we work to move beyond this? And the bloom of beauty and technology advancement is often prioritized over the deepening and the strength of the root. But the root is what is more important to our health. How can we tend to our roots? as we develop education innovation. And lastly, I know this is a, a topic close to your heart, Kath, um, and Phil, maybe many of you, we extract endlessly because we forget about regeneration and the natural cycles of birth, growth, death, and rebirth. How can regenerative practices be considered in education design? I'm gonna pass the baton over Shortly, I'd just like to give us a little sweet intro to a friend, uh, a mentor, and a huge inspiration, Phil Moore. Uh, my feeling is that he's here on Spaceship Earth, as Bucky Fuller would have said, to lift the spirit level. Phil was the director of the independent Upland Schools in Michigan for over 40 years. And I believe he's got so much to offer anyone who cares about how we're raising the next generation. He's the acclaimed author, he's a speaker, a mentor, and he's currently exploring his rewirement for his retirement. And our theme is close to his heart and he has so much to offer this active community of inspiring leaders. We spoke about the topic today, right, Phil? And he, I just said, okay, Phil, what, what should we talk about? What should we focus on? And he sparkled back at me and he said, Hope, I'm gonna read the audience, which is what Bucky would have done. Um, so Phil, I'd love you to show how you read the audience. Um, I'm pretty sure most meetings people are in these days don't begin with this heart test. 
So I'm just going to sh stop sharing and I'm going to let our very special guest, Phil, take the floor. And Phil, are you there? <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> There's a lot going through my uh, heart and head right now. So thank you so much, Hope, for uh, bringing us together. And uh, as I love to say that um, investing in bonds is really my strategy. When you are doing a school for as long as we were able to do one, and it's still in uh, very much alive and thriving, um, People sometimes from my friends from um, the dominant paradigm of education ask, you know, what about your pension? <laughs> and my answer to that is my uh, pension is the thousand children that I hold in my heart. And that's really what's happening at this moment. And so my requirement is really away from the role of being the director of a independent school in north of Detroit. Um, and we chose the term director mostly because of the film world. And so uh, if for all of you who are uh, on this call, it's really, for me, important to let you know that I became the director by default at the age of 23 of a school that had just started in 1971. And I uh, had been deeply inspired by my mentor, Buckminster Fuller, and Bucky, um, Bucky actually is known as the inventor of the geodesic dome and the dome was invented 73 years ago, <laughs> right here in North Carolina, not too far from where I am uh, in Black Mountain. And, um, and it was a failure, by the way. They got together in this big field and they came with all of this um, enthusiasm about building the first geodesic dome and it was built out of venetian blind material and it actually was put together with the whole faculty watching and all of the uh, the kids from college and it collapsed and uh it is now known as the supine dome and that that um that failure was really the beginning of Buckminster Fuller becoming, um, well, a teacher for, for my generation and many others all around the world. And what Bucky would do, and this is what Hope was talking about, is yeah. he would stand in front of a group of people and he would do his thinking out loud. And, th and this was his tuning in, is doing this. He would just kind of wag his fingers as he leaned forward. Arthur Penn was a film director at the time that Bucky met him. He was a student and he was, uh, uh, he's made some great films. Um, Alice's Restaurant is one that I remember. And um, Arthur told Bucky, you know, that you don't have to prepare for a lecture. All you have to do is tune into the frequency and then assume a character. And so that's what Bucky did for his entire life. And he would start by doing this. Now I can see your heads looking back at me. <laughs> and if you want to do this, you can, you can tune in with me as we're right. tuning in together and just get that wiggle finger thing going. Yeah, there you go. And um, think about it as being, you know, there used to be analog radios. Some of you may remember that you would just tune to the frequency and then it would come in and then it would go out and then it would come in and then it would lock in. And that's what Bucky would do. And so um, often he would just kind of stand there for a while as he was beginning to feel what was going to emerge in the moment. And, um, and that's uh, what I would like to do is, 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 is just kind of, first of all, start with gratitude. Gratitude to you, Hope, for being um, somebody who um, has the energy and effervescence to bring this beautiful group together. <laughs> to all of you for being here and sharing um, some time, um, that's, uh, that's so important. In the world of independent schools, uh, we often talked about time and talent and treasure because we were building community and we knew that all of those things were going to be extremely important 
in terms of a new leadership. So instead of having a board of directors, we had a council and we would always select people to join the council by virtue of those three things, time, treasure and talent. And then we would use the word tetrahedron sometimes and that might lose some people, but a tetrahedron is really the beginning of uh, what Buckminster Fuller called synergetic geometry. And so if you think of a triangular base and then a point above it, and then you just draw lines down to the triangle, you have a tetrahedron, which is the first shape that holds, holds its own shape. It has integrity. And the word integrity is very, very important to Bucky. So um, I'm gonna start by saying that in 1971, when a group of people got together in what we called the free school movement and decided to create a school, there was a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm and a lot of um, emphasis on what we would not be. So in other words, it was a reaction to the dominant paradigm of education. And it was in kind of the chaos of us coming together and enrolling our kids. And uh, Karen and I uh, brought our daughter Nina to that first year. She was six years old. Um, that the school began to fall apart pretty much as soon as it assembled. By the second month, there was all kinds of meetings about, you know, are we gonna be able to make it? And then by the third month, the director who was a professor at Wayne State University quit. And by the fourth month, I was asked to join the staff. And by the fifth month, I was given the, the task of being the director of the school because they did not wanna refund the thousand dollar tuition that they had charged for the 52 children who were there at that time. And, um, and, and then I just saw this as being, you know, an opportunity to live my life's dream. And uh, my mission then and now is really the same and it's always been the same, how to love children into being. So that's really simply the mission of Upland Hill School. Buckminster Fuller said something that caught my attention it was that every child is born a genius and degenius by unfavorable circumstances. And somehow that and his, um, his continually coming back to a very dark moment in his life when he and his wife, Anne, lost their first child, Alexandra, at the age of four um, in 1922. And it was to uh, a kind of spinal meningitis. And this little girl was kind of the center of Bucky's heart in so many ways. And her death um, threw him into a tremendous amount of grief. And he decided at that point in his life that he was going to try and do his own thinking. And that meant not being, not following everybody else's script, but following the script that he had internally in himself. And then he also talked about um, one night wanting to um, throw his life away. And so I was drawn into the, the, the sphere of Buckminster Fuller, first because um, whole, the whole earth catalog was dedicated to him. And when it came out in 1968, me and a bunch of my friends bought it, and it was kind of Google in paper. You know, it was before there was a Google search engine. Here was this beautiful catalog, and the first page of the catalog was dedicated to Buckminster Fuller. And so, um, like so many others who bought the first Whole Earth catalog, I read it from cover to cover and was so inspired by Bucky's work, I wanted to know more and more about him. By the time I come to the school, I had attended something called World Game, how to make the world work for 100% of humanity without disadvantaging the natural world. So that was Buckminster Fuller's magnum opus. It was the thing that he wanted all of us to work on more than anything else, because he believed that we had the tools to be able to do this. So uh, a group of us gathered at Southern Illinois University. Um, we were the second world gamers and we came together for six weeks to play world game, none of us knowing what the heck that meant. 
So you can imagine 36 people from all different walks of life in a very hot and humid place, Carbondale, Illinois. And, um, and we have six weeks to play world game. What I didn't know at that time is that I was being introduced to playing the infinite game. The infinite game is a game that um, does not have losers and winners. And it is a game that continues to expand in context, meaning you always invite more players to play. And when you play, you try to think of moves that are win, 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 win moves. And there we were stuck in the heat of Carbondale, Illinois, trying to figure out how to play world game, having no credentials whatsoever to do that, other than the fact that we signed up to do it. And um, by the time I get to that uh, first year of school, I had traveled with Nina and with Karen for 11 months in Europe and North Africa. And that was our kindergarten year for Nina. And it was an amazing way to bond Karen and I and Nina during those um, uh, 11 months and to see the world and to continue to play the infinite game. So the first step may have been just my buying the whole earth catalog like hundreds and thousands and millions of people did. And then by the time I get to the school, I have some ideas of, of what it might mean to create a school that was based on love rather than fear. And it took a long time to kind of get there. So I'm gonna talk in decades because that's something that an elder can do. <laughs> it used to be, if I could get from, you know, that first year of school, if I could get from the day that they asked me to be the director in February to the last day of school, that would be an enormous accomplishment. And I would feel, you know, like, oh my God, one year at a time. But now I can, I can look back and I can now think of each decade because it was the beginning of the 70s, it was easy to see that. And, uh, and what I can tell you is, is, is that when you're playing the infinite game, you continually uh, looking to be led by something that is m very much lacking in the dominant paradigm of education, especially today, as teachers are getting ready to go back to school or decide to retire from education altogether and administrators are getting together and the amount of anxiety and fear and concern and uncertainty are just everywhere as, as that's happening in this moment. What you need is to be led by something other than just your head. And so really um, my presentation is all about heart. And I'm happy to say that um, there was a moment at the beginning of 1980 when Buckminster Fuller showed up in our place. We had just built a building called the Upland Hills Ecological Awareness Center. And we had started another nonprofit organization. So those are the two nonprofit organizations that I was deeply connected to, the school and the Ecological Awareness Center. Bucky was giving a lecture at Oakland University, which was not too far from where the school is. And, um, a secretary who was working at Oakland University was writing my master's thesis. She was typing it, you know, and I had asked her to do that because I'm not a good typer. And in those days we didn't have computers. And so she was, she was typing it and she saw that I was deeply influenced by Buckminster Fuller. And then she let me know that. And so I got in touch with Buckminster Fuller's office and um, asked if it would be possible for Bucky to open the Upland Hills Ecological Awareness Center in January of 1980? And the answer was yes. And then the answer was, and would you pick him up at the lecture at one o'clock when it's done at Oakland University and, and take care of him until he leaves the following morning? So I got to be with Buckminster Fuller for about 12 hours. And, uh, and he gave the opening wisdom talk and we're talking about elders and that's why I'm introducing Bucky to you 
Because one of the things that you do know when you're 23 years old is that you don't know anything. You have lots of ideas and lots of enthusiasm and lots of vision and you can sometimes spin a good yarn. But what you really don't have is lots of experience. And that's why elders are, were incredibly important to me. And that's why Bucky was incredibly important to me. And that's why I'm forever thankful for him because I've always looked at him as a soul model rather than a, than a role model. And what I mean by that is, is, is that Bucky's soul was so luminous and alive in relationship that um, here he was 84 years old, adding something to his itinerary that would bring $100 back to Philadelphia where his office was. So that was what Shirley, his, um, his secretary and, and uh, assistant said, that could you make a donation for $100 for Bucky being with you for that evening and for that day? And, and so that's what it cost. And then, um, and then what I saw when I was with him was neoteny, the ability to keep young alive inside of a human body that was 84 years old. He was neotenous in every way. He was curious, he was fun, he was funny, he danced, he sang. He gave a talk for two and a half hours after giving a lecture for three hours at Oakland University. He took a nap. He ate dinner. He tried to win over our daughter, Sasha, because he was sitting on one side of Sasha during dinner. And my dad, uh, Sasha's grandfather, was on the other side. And the two of them spent most of dinner trying to get her attention. So what I saw was how vibrant and alive he was. And that if that was possible at the age of 84, traveling alone, by the way, and it was January and he really didn't have a winter coat. So it was, it was, kind, of, it was kind of amazing to me when I you know, was with him and back at his hotel room and he opened up his briefcase and there was a, uh, a, a tool that we called uh, tensegrity, something that makes a shape and it doesn't, you can't really see immediately how it, it works and holds together because it's tension and compression. But um, he, he really didn't have a suitcase that I could see. So he was pretty much traveling uh, as light as you could possibly travel and um, not even connected to weather in some sense because it was January in Michigan. Uh, it was January 30th, 1980. So um, what happened really was, is, is that as we began to design the school, we kept returning to every child is born a genius and the true function of education is to draw out these gifts, whatever that profile was. And then we wanted to also create an entire foundation. Structure and architecture was very important to Bucky. And all of us know that foundation is the importance of any building that we take on. So what would the foundation be? And we, we aligned with the idea that love is the foundation. So what the school was dedicated to was really growing um, loving children into being, which meant that there was this deep connection between the heart and the head. And it's very difficult when you have parents who are enrolling their kids to your school, it's very difficult sometimes to communicate that this is what the school is about, because as we know, as educators, that school is usually about things like curriculum and, and, and the kinds of content that you're going to learn and what you need to know. And what we uh, did and what we discovered was that if you teach context rather than content, if you focus on context rather than content, then you can create um, neural net pathways in these children that wire in a certain way and the natural world is the primary teacher. That was something that was very clear to us. And so, um, 
really the, the, the thing that I want to communicate to you mostly as innovators in education is, is, is that the role of the heart and the connection between the heart and the head is so essential for children today. And loving someone into being means that you accept that there is an inner script for every child. There is a soul's code for every child. And that soul's code is yours to uh, nourish, nurture, defend, and foster. And it sounds strange. I know in the world of education, you know, for us to be talking about souls or talking about love, but um, really it seems to me to be the most essential thing as we innovate. So thanks to Hope, I've met some people who are some of them here on this call. And, uh, and I've really been so impressed by the numbers of initiatives that are being made in the infinite game. The other thing about playing an infinite game is you don't play by the rules, you play with the rules. And it's a very important distinction because um, in academia, as you all know, there are very specific rules about how you play this game called education. And what we did and what we were able to do because we were really in a forest near a monastery on a farm tucked away, you know, 30 miles away from the city of Detroit. So we were able to um, get away with what we were doing because we had a, a kind of a sacred bubble of protection. And by doing that, you could, you could change the rules. You could um, play with the rules of education as long as you were in a heart-to-heart -heart connection with the parents and with the staff and with the council of elders that would be the board of directors. And so uh, what happened, I would say 10 years ago, was that in some strange way, I knew from this connection that I had been led by that uh, we should have a 40th birthday party for Upland Hill School. So I asked um, uh, our staff to kind of align with this idea. We're gonna turn 40, nobody thought we'd make it past two, you know, and now we're gonna turn 40. So let's have a celebration. So it was kind of like a mini Woodstock. We, uh, put out to as many people as we could that we were going to all come together in May. And I had in my heart this idea that this might be a good enough reason for our daughter Nina to travel with her five children and introduce all five of those children to our school in this weekend event that we had in the 40th, um, as a 40th birthday celebration for the school. Having no um, idea that when the 50th would come, we would be in the midst of COVID. So in 2020, when our school was shut down, as so many other schools were, you know, there was no way that anybody could think about doing anything like celebrating at Upland Hill School. And that was the year that Karen and I moved here to North Carolina. All of these I'm kind of sharing with you as moves in the infinite game. And so what I thought that I would do, not just to share Buckminster Fuller, but there were several other elders. Jean Houston was one of them. And if you don't know Jean's work, I highly recommend. There's things that she offers online on a regular basis having to do with quantum shifting. And Jean uh, was kind enough to write the preface of the book, uh, The Future of Children. So she became a very important person during the transition, but at the end of that 40th birthday party and all, I have a picture of on my, on my computer right now on my screen that has all of the five grandchildren and Nina, you know, at that, at that moment in time. What I was doing um, after it was all over is I was walking around as the director, which means that you're the janitor sometimes and that you're the one who has to deal with all of the messes that are in the spaces that are in all of the buildings and the grounds around. And so I was taking that tour after the 40th 
and it was a wonderful success. And there was just tremendous magic that happened during that, those three days. And then all of a sudden I felt from my heart, you're done. Mm. And, uh, and then I thought, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm done. And then it was, it's time to move on. You're gonna need some time to do it and to do it artfully, but it's time for you to leave this place. Mm. Well, by that time, we had lived there for 40 years and it was pretty hard to imagine leaving that place, but I was getting instructions from um, the great mystery. And I think that has to do with alternatives. I don't know how the word, you know, landed in education. I do know during the dominant paradigm, during those 40 years, they would say, we're gonna create alternative schools in the public schools. And what they meant by that was they were gonna take all of the um, most difficult kids that they had in their school, put them in one classroom and take the most um, idealistic teacher in the world and put them in charge of those kids. They called that alternative education. It was usually a recipe for a disaster or a heart attack or colitis or some other condition. Um, but there, uh, there is uh, in the world of uh, in, in, in the world of trans surfing, there are alternate realities. And what I know now is that those realities exist if we choose them. If we choose to go off of the regular path and we go on to that reality, there's a whole reality there that exists if we live with our heart and our head together. So I'm looking at time and I'm thinking that I've gone on plenty long. And um, I just wanted to you know, acknowledge all of you and what you're doing and, um, and invite you to consider yourselves playing world game or an infinite game. And that um, making moves in the infinite game, you need a, a tribe. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh you know, is, is, is quoted as saying, the next Buddha will be a Sangha. And the interbeing exercise that, that, um, that I discussed with Hope is really an opportunity for us to meet um, in dyads and, and to have that interbeing be awakened. It sounds like I made the decision alone to do this 40th birthday uh, party, but nothing was ever done alone. Absolutely nothing was ever done alone. It was all in a collective field. And actually we were on a field trip for 40 years. <laughs> That's really what happened at Uplandville School. Uh, and the field trip had uh, two fields. It had the actual fields. We had beautiful farmland that we were able to play all school games on and it's still done to this day. And so we had that field. And of course we had the field trips where you go out and you go to Stratford in Ontario and you take the kids, you know, all of those things. Um, but there was another field and that was the field that we had with the standing ones and with the land. The field was the field of the natural world. And we were raised by that field and we were protected. That's an important part of uh, loving children into being is they have, to be, they have to feel safe and they have to feel seen and they have to know and trust that you love them in order for it to really work. And so- um, Thank you, Phil. What... Thank you. Wow. Oh, 